Okay. So, uh, welcome Vladimir ji, Radhe ji. Uh, namaste. My name is Kiran Singh, coordinator of CLC, Oro University, Surat, India. It is my pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of Sri Aurobindo Integral Life Center, Oro University, Surat, India, and, and La Grasse, South Carolina, USA. Both the centers operate on the vision of Honorable H.P. Ramaji, who is founder, president of Oro University too. Today's talk and discussion is by Dr. Vladimir Ji, who is a scholar, researcher, and facilitator of the course online in the Vedic and Vedic Vedantic studies, Sanskrit language and literature, aligned with various educational institutions like IPI Pondicherry, International Center for Integral Studies, Delhi, University of Human Unity, Oroville, and Sri Aurobindo Integral Life Center in Fountain Inn, CA, SSE, USA. Today's interaction is in continuation of our previous panel dis discussion on emergence of new social order. Many psychologists, neuropsychologists, and philosophers developed the theories of development like social consciousness as a process involving increasing awareness of social historical context. The ability to think abstractly about time and place and beyond the immediate everyday conditions to understand individual experience as embedded in a broader system of social relations. There is a developmental variability in the extent to which people are aware of the impact that culture and society have on them and that they in turn can have on their environment. Psychological, social, and neuropsychological theories of development indicate that as we grow and interact with the world, we learn to categorize, discriminate, and generalize about what we see and feel. The beliefs, assumptions, attitudes, values, and ideas form a comprehensive model of reality. We construct complex and conceptual framework to organize our beliefs about who we are and about the world we live in. Humans, human perceptions are filtered by the ways people, be, uh, people view the world. People's worldviews therefore influence every aspect of how they understand and interact with the world around them. For this, we use the term social consciousness, which means conscious awareness of being part of an interrelated community of others. Social consciousness refers to the level of explicit awareness a person has of being part of a larger whole. The theorists and psychologists discussed in their theories majorly about the five levels of consciousness, which include embedded, self-reflexive, engaged, collaborative, and resonant. All these theories much more talk about ex extrinsic impact of awareness. But Sri Aurobindo developed a new philosophy of life. Being a part of the national movement, he developed the idea of socio-political actions from a purely spiritual standpoint. He proclaimed that an individual spiritual development can lead to focused activity in social and political reformation. The vision of such activities would come from consciousness itself, which is called collective consciousness that gets evolved during the process of spiritual development. The speciality and perhaps the uniqueness of Sri Aurobindo's spiritual development lie in the fact that this involves an evolutionary perspective. So today we have Sri Vladimir Ji, who will be discussing these aspects through sociological and historical approaches to consciousness in Indian tradition and integral yoga. As well as he will talk about four powers of divine Shakti and four constituents of social order of knowledge, power, bliss, and perfection. Sri Arvindo and the mother on evolution of consciousness and species and the double process of ter terrestrial evolution and the mother on the widening, deepening, and heightening of the individual consciousness. Before we begin, I would like to request all in the audience to participate by asking questions. To do that, please type a question in a question answer box at any time during the talk. We'll keep track of all questions and share them at the end of the talk. Thank you so much. Now I request Vladimirji to begin the session. Thank you. Thank you, Kiranji, very much. Um, indeed for this introduction and um, and for your overview of what social consciousness is uh, because it makes my uh, task much easier now <laughs> i don't need to go into the introduction of what it is 
Um, but as a student of the Veda and integral yoga, I approached this subject uh, from a bit different perspective. By the way, I welcome all the questions during the session. If you have some um, um, comments also, you please uh, put them into the question and answer box. Um, first of all, to start this uh, overview, um, I want to say that we have different approaches to our life, to our consciousness. So if we... Um, let me project it in full screen. Um, if we look at our consciousness, how it functions, we could see that we have different faculties. The faculty of thinking or the faculty, we could say, of um, self-reflection or uh, of uh, uh, self-identification. Uh, and. Uh, that self-knowledge, that active subjective self-knowledge, uh, recognizing oneself as such, can be projected onto the bigger scheme and then it becomes more viewing the, the relations. Uh, there is a uh, request to speak louder. <laughs> Yes, and um, if we view um, already this projection of self-knowledge onto the world, we could see that it creates another, or it involves another faculty of consciousness. And uh, we have also uh, the uh, comprehensive faculty of self-expression, which is speaking and um, if it is projected, the self-expression of individual projected into the bigger unit, it becomes uh, the hearing that that which is exchanged, the vibration, the communication, language, society, where there is uh, um, one uh, unit which embodies all the relations of individuals. Then it comes down to the manifestation knowledge, which represents these relations of self-knowledge and spirit knowledge. Uh, and there we have more subjective feelings. And finally, the outer projection of touch, where we recognize the physical entity and reality of oneself different from other entities. I'm taking all these six major faculties from the Upanishads as it is declared in the Taittiriya Upanishad that Brahman is, or the spirit is Annam Pranam Chakshuk Shrotram Mano Vacham Iti. And I'm trying to look deeper into these faculties. So if I take them into the domain of um, uh, humanities, we could see that self-knowledge or the identifying oneself and any object in the world, identifying with oneself, knowledge by identity is what we may call psychological approach. So subjective self-knowledge is psychological approach. That's what we in the integral yoga do. We try to identify who we truly are, our true individuality and um, simultaneously our true um, bigger body you know, of uh, what, what are we as human beings. But when we look at it, at this subjective or at this self-knowledge objectively, projecting it onto the bigger body, we uh, arrive at philosophical approach to knowledge. When we view our subjective findings in the objective context, in the vaster context, how others are doing, how others are reacting, whether our psychology is um, uh, corresponding with psychology with other beings. So that's what we may call philosophical approach. Now, linguistic approach is the, uh, the self-expression, the expression of oneself, subjective, um, self-expression, what we speak, what we want, what we communicate to others. And the very 
objectivization of this subjective self-expression becomes our sociological or historical approach. Sociological, we can say it is a, a synchronic uh, perspective or on the scale of space, where it is historically uh, diachronic on the, on the scale of time. But it is a bigger body, bigger relational body through which we communicate, relate, and this relation is taking place through our faculties. And there are two more manifestation uh, knowledge approaches. Subjective is more artistic, where we create art, beauty, uh, culture, uh, that self-expression, subjective self-expression, which manifests something, some truth of ourselves in the form of life. And finally, scientific approach, where we view the manifestation knowledge in objective sense as such, as matter, material, physical, chemical uh, processes of life. Uh, why it is important for me at the beginning to mention it? Because of uh, one reason, that I want to define what is so sociological or historical approach, that it is one of many very important, but one of many. So if we look at our scheme of things, we can see that we may have approaches which are fundamental and domains which these approaches create. So psychology can be a psychological approach to knowledge and also a domain which, uh, which is created by this approach over time. So psychological approach can be applied to any other domain. So we can apply psychology to philosophy and it will be psychology of philosophy, psychology of language, if you apply it to language, psychology of social development, if we apply it to history and social development, sociology. This is exactly that point which uh, I wanted to mention. You know, with in relation to Sri Aurobindo's psychology of social development, how he views sociology from psychological perspective. And we can have psychology of art, psychology of science, and so on. We can have philosophy of psychology, philosophy of language, philosophy of history. All these subjects are available today. Uh, and it's quite interesting to view uh, from the um, domain perspective and from the approach. If you look at uh, our development of consciousness from the psychological, from the uh, historical or sociological approach, we would have history of psychology, history of philosophy, history of language, history of social development, a history of art and history of science. But if we view them from different approaches, uh, so the very developmental paradigm of uh, social development, we could have psychology of social development, philosophy of history, or philosophy of social development, language of history, history of social development, which is properly sociology and history. And finally, art of history and science of history. Uh, so just wanted to show you this um, vast picture of approaches, which we may mention during our presentation. So why sociology is important, uh, Kiranji already mentioned, sociology and history deal with relationship as such, how individual and collective relate to one another on the scale of space, sociology and time history. Now I'm coming to the beginnings, the Vedic vision, the Indian approach to historicity. Indian approach to history is very different from a Western approach. And there is a reason for it, because India has uninterrupted uh, tradition 
starting from the Vedic times, from the symbolic age, and still remembers those structures of consciousness which evolved finally, uh, starting from Satya Yuga, arriving at Kali Yuga, speaking in, in Indian language. Um, this uninterrupted tradition was maintained by Sanskrit language and literature and helped India to form very unique approach to history. Um, it is not uh, conventional, it is not uh, in the form of the mental structure as it was formed in the West because Western approach to history started from Greeks maybe a little earlier from uh, Chaldean tradition, but it had always this um, rationalistic approach where things had to be noted down with years, with names, uh, who was uh, uh, doing what and so on, which wasn't the case in Indian tradition because India views the development of a social paradigm on the bigger scale. So the ancient paradigm of social order was built on the vision of functionality of individual. This is something uh, very interesting. Every social organism is a kind of individual with all necessary functions of the individuals for they are to interact with each other. These four varnas, or colors represent the holistic approach to the social life of men known as Brahmanas. These are four Varnas which we know as Jatis later we know them. Brahmanas, men of knowledge, priests and teachers. Kshatriyas, men of power, ruling class, kings, royalties. Vaishyas, men of delight as vital exchange of goods and services, merchants and traders. And uh, as generators of enjoyment also, wealth and food, farmers, entertainers, etc. And Shudras, men of service and help, workers and servants. So they are in the Veda, they are symbolically identified in Purusha Suktam with four parts of the human body. The mouth which speaks the word, the word that knows, the knowledge, the manifestation of some intention, higher intention of the spirit, the hands and the shoulder belt, which, which is the power, a power which can rule, uh, arrange things, create things, organize things. Then we have torso or thighs, uh, which belong to the production or, and reproduction organs, uh, the exchange of delight, and finally, legs or feet which support the being. Mm. Uh, so uh, it's inbuilt in the very body of the individual, all the universal faculties of the universal Purusha who was sacrificed and created these particular mm, activities of consciousness. So anthropomorphic structure of society, we can see Purusha Suktam 1090. I already spoke about this. His mouth became Brahmanas, uh, his arms power uh, became Rajanyas, kings, his uh, thighs became Vaishyas, merchants and traders, and his legs became Shudras. Hmm. What is interesting that these four, if we look deeper, we will see that these four are generated by or from uh, four powers, transcendental powers of the Divine Mother, Aditi in the Veda. So the ancient sociological vision of the collective life is based on the four major powers of the Mother Aditi as infinite consciousness cognizant of purity and vastness of the divine being, Sat Maheshwari. These are Brahmanas, as it were, who are always perceiving the truth as it is. Uh, power and the energy of the, the divine Shakti, Chittapas Mahakali. 
delight and the beatitude of the divine harmony, Ananda, uh, Mahalakshmi, and effectiveness and perfection of the divine realization, Vijnana, Mahasaraswati. Um, so the human being individually and socially embodies these major faculties or functions of the divine, of knowledge, power, delight, and perfection. What is interesting, if you look at uh, this development on the scale of time, not on the scale of not um, synchronically, as it were, but diachronically, we will see that, um, uh, that the same story repeats itself in the periods of time. So Satya Yuga, or the age of the truth, or the golden age, uh, called also Krita Yuga, uh, is uh, the age of number four, where all four uh, manifestations of four powers of the mother uh, are harmoniously and efficiently or transparently uh, present and uh, the truth, the perception of the truth can embody itself in all the aspects of life. Uh, it is kind of Brahmanic formation, where the Brahmanas were at home, so to say. They were totally, mm, how to say, uh, ac active and uh, efficient in their life. In the Treta Yuga, there was a shift. The shift, the Brahmanas became, so to say, not absolutely active and uh, transmitting the truth of the being, but they became the mm, uh, the counselors, the helpers for the kings. The kings took charge of the social order and Brahmins were their advisors, uh, very valuable advisors, uh, and, but still uh, advisors. They didn't have that leading role anymore. So in this age, the, the concept of dharma was formed as a typal age, we will see later in Sri Aurobindo's language. Uh, and that is the age of triads, where the three are more active than the four. The fourth one fades away. And Dvapara Yuga, the Yuga of number two, is interesting. So uh, it's uh, starting from the Bronze Age or something of that kind to make a reference to the modern uh, sociology. Uh, Dvapara Yuga was uh, more of the conventional age where the Vaishyas took charge the money, the wealth, the enjoyment, the exchange of services started to make more sense than just military force. Uh, they became a major driving power. And finally, the Kali Yuga, the age of number one, uh, which starts, which is called also Iron Age, uh, where the, mm, the truth is already uh, kind of narrowed down to a very uh, specific perception of um, uh, effectiveness of action. And what is interesting in this view, it is also viewed in, uh, in a very traditionalistic way as the cow, the cow of Dharma in the Satya Yuga stands on four legs, in the Treta Yuga on three legs, and Dvapara Yuga on two legs, and finally in Kali Yuga only on one leg, which is very difficult to maintain the balance. So what is interesting um, to compare this traditional Indian uh, system with Sri Aurobindo's developmental stages. We could see that he speaks about symbolic age in the same way as Satya Yuga is uh, described in the Indian tradition 
uh, typal age, which is forming the dharma, and finally conventional age, where the vaishyas are becoming more prominent in individualist age, the age of proletariat, of the workers, of the effectiveness of the embodiment and manifestation of things. And um, we are uh, at the brink of uh, subjective age. So individualist age leads us to the subjective age, to rediscovery of our true self. So I would uh, give a few examples here from Sri Aurobindo, which is quite important to read. Uh, I will read them out. They are self-explanatory and profound. The first, the symbolic age, of this evolution is predominantly religious and spiritual. The other elements, psychological, ethical, economic, uh, physical, uh, are there, but subordinate to the spiritual and religious idea. The second stage, which we may call the typo, is predominantly psychological and ethical. All else, even the spiritual and religious, is subordinate to the psychological idea and to the ethical ideal, which expresses it. Religion becomes then a mystic sanction for the ethical motive and discipline, dharma, that becomes its chief social utility. And for the rest, it takes a more and more otherworldly turn. So that connection to the spirit becomes otherworldly, mystical. It's no more real. The dharma is real, the duty. The idea of the direct expression of the divine being or cosmic principle in man ceases to dominate or to be the leader and in the forefront. It recedes stands in the background and finally disappears from the practice and in the end even from the theory of life. That's what we are here in this moment of time, yes? It disappeared even from the theory of life. The typal stage creates the great social ideals which remain impressed upon the human upon the human mind, even when the stage itself is past. The honor of the Brahmin, which resides in purity and piety, in a disinterested possession and exclusive pursuit of learning and knowledge. The honor of the Kshatriya, which lives in courage, chivalry, uh, strength, a certain proud self-restraint and self-mastery, nobility of character and the obligations of that nobility. The honor of the Vaishya, which maintains itself by a rectitude of dealing, uh, mercantile, fidelity, um, sound production, order, liberality and philanthropy the honor of Shudra, which gives itself in obedience, subordination, faithful service, uh, disinterested attachment. So this typal age impressed on, upon us the ideal of duty, the purity of these forces or the major manifestations of the Divine Mother. Uh, I will take next slide. The conventional age. There is some question. In the conventional age, we see the shift even farther away from the uh, direct perception of the spirit. But these more and more, these purities, these visions, these uh, duties, dharmas, more and more cease to have a living root in the clear psychological idea 
or to spring naturally out of the inner life of the man. They become a convention. Though the most noble of conventions, in the end they remain more as a tradition in the thought and on the lips than, in, than a reality of the life. We are talking about them more than doing them, than living these uh, duties. For the typo passes naturally into the conventional stage. The conventional stage of human society is born when the external supports, the outward expressions of the spirit or the ideal become more important than the ideal or the sorry, or the ideal become more important than the ideal, the body or even the cloth is more important than the person. So the representation becomes more important than what is behind the content, the how, the representation the is more important than the what, the content of this presentation. So the form, the cloth rather than the body, the being. At first birth does not seem to have been of the first importance in the social order. The faculty and capacity prevailed, but afterwards, as the type fixed itself, its maintenance by education and tradition became necessary and education and tradition naturally fixed themselves in hereditary groove. So that's how it shifted from the typal to the conventional. So we know what we must be, but life is very different from what we really are. So, and as a reaction to this conventional age, void of the spirit of the truth, there was the, mm, the coming of the individualistic age. Age. So individualist age, the principle of individualism is the liberty of the human being regarded as a separate existence to develop himself and to fulfill his life, satisfy his mental tendencies, emotional and vital needs and physical being according to his own desire governed by his reason. It admits no other limit to this right and this liberty except the obligation to respect the same individual liberty and right in others. This is a very important um, a discovery or move of our consciousness to be true to ourselves, uh, first of all, to have true life with others, to respect their individual needs, individual um, search for themselves. And equally, Shirobindo says, in the life of nations, the individualistic age made liberty the ideal and strove, though with the less success than in its own proper sphere, to affirm a mutual respect for each other's freedom as a, the proper conduct of nations to one another. In this idea of life, as with the individual, so with the nation, each has the inherent right to manage its own affair freely, or if it wills to mismanage them freely and not to be interfered with in its rights and liberties so long as it does not interfere with the rights and liberties of other nations. It's a very interesting overview because it's exactly what is happening today. We can see Mm, that we allow every nation to determine themselves. South, uh, North Korea, for example, has full right to be what they want to be, even if it is not totally in accordance with our vision. So the development of international law, speaks Shirobindo, into the, an effective force which will restrain the egoism of nations as the social law restrains the egoism of individuals is the solution 
which still attracts and seems the most practicable, practicable uh, to most when they speak, when they seek to deal with the difficulties of the future. So we are uh, in the stage of uh, um, international law interfering uh, uh, in the special cases where there are wars or claims on the, the territory between different nations, as it is happening now between Russia and Ukraine, for example. So the coming of the subjective age, this is the final um, slide, and I will open our uh, discussion and questions uh, for, um, for this session. So the coming of the subjective age is the most interesting. We are at the brink of this subjective age. Therefore, says Sri to find the truth of things and the law of his being in relation to that truth, he must go deeper and fathom the subjective secret of himself and things as well as their objective forms and surroundings. In his study of himself and the world, he cannot but come face to face with the soul in himself and the soul in the world and find it to be an entity so profound, so complex, so full of hidden secrets and powers that his intellectual reason betrays itself as a, an insufficient light and a fumbling seeker. The need of the deeper knowledge must then turn him to the discovery of new powers and means within himself. He finds that he can, can only know himself entirely by becoming actively self-conscious and not merely self-critical. This is a distinction, self-conscious and not merely self-critical by more and more living in his soul and acting out of it rather than floundering on surfaces. In this process of rationalistic ideal, in this process, the rationalistic ideal begins to subject itself to the ideal of intuitional knowledge and a deeper self-awareness. The utilitarian standard gives way to the aspiration towards self-consciousness and self-realization. The rule of living according to the manifest laws of physical nature is replaced by the effort towards living according to the veiled law and will and power active in the life of the world and in the inner and outer life of humanity. So these are the stages of the development and they are beautifully corresponding with the ancient Indian vision of uh, yugas, Satya Yuga, uh, Treta Dvapara and Kali Yuga, and there are Maha Yugas which constitute Manvantaras, and there are uh, 14 manvantaras in one kalpa. So there is the whole developmental vision of our growing in consciousness. So what I learned from these texts is uh, what I discovered for myself is that, uh, that uh, through individual only, the development of the social structure takes place. So the social, the universal structure, the social consciousness, the universal consciousness, which is behind any social consciousness is revealing deeper and deeper layers of its power and consciousness and knowledge uh, through individuals evolving within the social structure. This is my discovery. Okay, I will stop at this moment and open to the questions and answers if there are some. If not, uh, please uh, make some comments, observations, if you have some deeper thoughts on this topic.
thank you vladimir ji uh, it it was wonderful you know journey to uh, through your presentation uh, we got to know about uh, social consciousness i have one question uh, although you know in last you mentioned about individual consciousness so what is the role of individual consciousness uh, or social con in collective consciousness or social consciousness how individual consciousness affect and what one should do for that right um well individual consciousness is the only one which is actually evolving here yes shabindo says that the social or the body of social consciousness which is behind supporting any development of the social structure is actually not evolutionary um, entity it is um, a universal entity it's like a shakti of the spirit which supports certain um, evolution of individuals here and their relations and because it is multi-layered it reveals deeper layers of the universal consciousness through individuals being in the evolutionary process and interaction so of course we understand that uh, social structure supports individual development and uh, individual is constantly disturbing this equilibrium of the social structure which is constant uh, which is often stiffening and making uh, things uh, for individual difficult because it drags individual back to its own formation which is already established and um, individual is constantly struggling with social structure and modifying it and changing it and uh, um so this kind of dialectics is going on yes? when the social structure is very uh, powerful uh, as it is in socialistic or communistic countries where the social norm is imposed on every individual then it becomes suffocating for the for the development and such structures cannot sustain themselves because they need the individual development that's basically the strength of the uh, capitalistic paradigm uh, where the liberalism the 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 freedom of the individual was declared as the major uh, the major uh, law of existence and in that sense individual can uh build up any social relations because he is free to find himself and to do as he likes uh of course there are restrictions he cannot uh, kind of uh, as shubindo mentions here um violate the freedoms of other individuals so here this uh, dialectical relations we can see it yeah capitalism against socialism in a way where the <coughs> the convention dominates the individual and where the individual is free to build up the convention so to say there are some questions of uh, marta orton um, okay let me see okay you. uh and there is a question from gaurav ji gaurav ashish from aro university uh, from school of business are meeting grounds feasible between the subjective and objective with the respect to self knowledge and manifestation knowledge what is the role of purusharth in this process yes purusharth has yes thank you gaurav um well purusharthas it's um, if you also a very interesting view of uh, your artha kama uh, dharma and moksha these were i think they came up in the mental structure of consciousness where the individualist age already started in india you see individualist age in india started from the beginning of kali yuga or from kurukshetra time where krishna shri krishna first uh, was in this uh, kurukshetra battle and arjuna asks him how come that you mixed up 
our social conventions, dharmas or jatis. You mixed up jatis. Now we will not know who is who, who is born in which family, because the convention was fixed in such a way when you are born in the family of Brahmins, you're Brahmin. When you're born in the family of Kshatriyas, you're Kshatriya, must be that. But now, since you mixed uh, jatis, and uh, nobody knows who is who, if in the family of Brahmins, uh, somebody else can be born, uh, Vaishya or Kshatriya or Shudra. And in the family of Shudras, Brahmana can be born. So how would we know now? Where is the truth? This is what he asks. Because Krishna demolishes, destroys the conventional age. That is the most important function. That is the major meaning of Kurukshetra, to destroy, to demolish that which is no more functional. And we saw in uh, Mahabharata that it is not functional, that the kings of high quality treated Draupadi as a slave immediately, from the queen to the slave. That means that the whole truth it disappeared. There is no more truth, only the form, the shell, the shell of that, uh, of that which is void of the truth. So Krishna was there to destroy that shell and to bring the truth back. And his answer is interesting. He says, now everyone in his heart uh, my Brahmanas, Kshatriyas even, uh, even Shudras and women, he says, will find me the Supreme. This is the individualistic turn of consciousness towards individual finding the truth in the heart. So <clears throat> um, where these Purusharthas stand? So the question is, these Purusharthas are um, uh, the... Um, the convention of the Kali Yuga's time, so to say, we have to fulfill our um, uh, fulfill ourselves totally in this world. So we have to dedicate certain activities to certain realizations in time. So we have to acquire certain wealth, we have to uh, build the families and have our family life. We have to follow the dharma, the duty that which was created by the typal age, that ideal of the force which we represent in this world. And finally, we have to be free. We have to find the spirit, moksha. So this is a very great... Um, no, how to say, uh, uh, formulation of the truths in our everyday life, what we have to realize in this life. I'm sure that is quite uh, difficult to answer this question because it's deeper and maybe there is not enough time to go deep enough into every of these um, topics of what is karma, what is artha, what is dharma and moksha yeah yeah so thank you vladimirji second i don't know i feel tempted to ask one more question from my side and then i'll ask others uh, like uh, one side because gauravji asked about uh, purushartha i feel that uh, what is the role of dharma because uh, i see krishna as individual and he worked uh, he created that social consciousness, you know, by playing his own role. And then one side he talks about Purusha, the other side he talks about Dharma. So what is the, uh, today in this situation, what do you think that, you know, how Dharma will play a role in an individual's life and how it will impact the social, you know, consciousness? Yeah, Dharma belongs to the formation of the typal age, according to Sri Aurobindo, which is very yeah, nobility, purity, and of the particular force uh, embodied in society in psychological terms. So if I am psychologically truly believe in knowledge and disinterested action, of course, I will be very valuable for the society and its development. So the type of age has its impact and its truth in this um, age of individualism and subjective age, especially. Um, 
Of course, subjective age is, uh, as Shubindu says, is quite dangerous because it opens up the hidden forces, the sub subconscious and superconscious forces to individual directly. Individual is no more protected as he was protected in the conventional and typal and even symbolic age. There, there was a wall, as Shirbindo says, built around individual, protecting him from deciding what is right and what is wrong. It was all kind of available to him through society, through the social structure. Now, he's a little bit uh, bewildered. He's lost. He has to find the truth in himself. He has to find the truth in his heart. It is that which uh, which led Mother to build uh, the project Auroville. Auroville was built on the ground of this vision. You know, when they came to the mother and asked her, how would we know who is to be in Auroville and who is not? We need some rules, some regulations. Give us rules by which we can measure others coming to Auroville. And you know what she answered? She answered, as long as there are no rules and regulations, no rules, there is still a hope for Auroville. This is the subjective age. The truth is to be recognized within us. It cannot be recognized without. Right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, next question is from uh, Gitanjali Jain. Is the mm -hmm. subjective age the return of the symbolic age in the next curve of the spiral of evolution? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Subjective age is the beginning of our symbolic age, so to say. Subjective age is that transition to the symbolic age where the truth again shines through individuals and through social uh, structure. Um, uh, Meg, uh, Dr. Meghna Dandi from Moro University, uh, she is asking, do you think that the present pandemic has actually acted as a catalyst and uh, accelerated our journey towards the discovery of social consciousness? Is the present situation a landmark event in the course of evolution? Is there any mention of this kind of calamity in the text of Sri Aurobindo? In continuation, there are many questions. In continuation, do you think it makes us rethink the purpose of everything from existence to education, etc.? Absolutely. I think this is the, the hidden plan because all the, uh, so to say, forces of uh, um, resistance and suffering and uh, in this case disease and death even and threatening the life of humanity and the virus uh, are permitted as mother says only because they are triggering in us a search for the truth deeper truth uh, if these forces uh, are allowed to act they are allowed to act only for this purpose that we will find deeper solution deeper truth within ourselves so uh, pandemics played its very important role we became aware not only of how we depend on social structures and social order because we are so dependent um, but also pushed us in towards the finding of our peace and truth with ourselves this kind of social distancing uh, gave us time to reflect, to review what is going on with us. We are so much in this rush, in this total constant running towards some goals and some, you know, uh, objectives that we already forgot who we are, where we are. And so it gave us time and space and peace to review ourselves in this um, world and see the world in a different perspective. So through this kind of moment, through this pause, some force, some ray of light may, may enter <laughs> and illumine something within us, so something very valuable and necessary for the future. Yeah, uh, next question is from Martha Alton. She is, she is asking, uh, please elaborate on, on this theme further 
uh, that is she is making you make the very important and relevant points of interrelation between the individual and the society including in the evolutionary process so she is asking that please elaborate on this theme further unless other questions intervene it is so encouraging to understand that the individual can have real impact on the wider society right this is um, the most um, yes the most secret and the most misunderstood topic how individual and society develop together whether society at all develops or individuals um, only develop and societies are so to say as um, spiritual shaktis or formations just reveal deeper layers of consciousness and force uh, which is behind, which is in the depth of that particular formation. Uh, so subjective age also led us to the, to the need of the discovery of true society, not only true individual. Once the individual started to dig deeper into himself, to examine himself, he discovered not only the social order, which is very, very um, conventionalistic and conservative, but also uh, the individual started to look for the true uh, social um, formation. And the nation was discovered in this way. Nation became the nation soul, became that uh, objective of the true social formation. And that is the second step in the, in the discovery of the truth of individual, the nation, and finally the human unity. As Sri Bindu says, these are three steps of Vishnu. First, the family, uh, the individual within the family, the love within the family, then the love relation uh, within the nation, the bigger body between the people who do not know the, um, uh, themselves directly, each other directly, and finally, the human unity can be prepared. So um, the, the, what I discovered is, um, is very interesting. Um, maybe it's a little bit uh, too much to mention now, but since you asked me this question, I discovered that species, as Mother says, species as human beings, for example, or animal kingdom, cats and dogs and, you know, elephants and so on, um, fish of different type, they have limited mm, capacity to evolve or to develop rather. Limited capacity by the very body, by the very formation which is, which is within them. So they can develop to a certain degree and stop in their development. Now, within this species, the individual self may develop and may want to have another formation because this formation of these species is no more sufficient for uh, uh, its quest for the truth. So the individual is kind of going from layer to layer. These species are like layers by, uh, laid by nature um, through which individual is gradually developing and moving from species to species, from animal kingdom to the human kingdom and to the superhuman kingdom. And nature is catching up and creating these formations, which are called species. But they are not evolutionary towards, uh, uh, towards the end. They stop stopping their evolution, their development at certain stage. But individual does not stop. Individual goes through them, using them, using them for his manifestation in the future also. That's why these species of the plants and uh, of the insects and fish and birds, all of them, they are fixed in their development in particular way. And they are organizing for, the, for us this ecosystem in which we, these individuals who are going through these layers can develop even higher. And this complexity is very difficult to see and understand, but it is really a fascinating vision. I do not know whether I could answer this, uh, uh, but I'm at least I'm putting this question forward to examine this and to dive into this topic 
and to try to understand it better. Thank you. Uh, another question is from Dr. Monica Suri from Oro University School of Business. Yeah. Uh, hello, uh, dear Vladimir ji. Please explain the role of organization at this time of pandemic that the whole world is facing and how spirituality and social consciousness can help the survival and sustainability of all stakeholders. Yes, how? This is, um, we, are, uh, we are entering into the subjective age from our individualist age. We see that we need more social organization in the world, that all the countries have to work together now. All of them are looking for this vaccine, for this solution. They understand how we depend. Now we understand how we depend on each other. We are not only rivalries, we are also collaborators. And the spirit of collaboration is uh, a new thing emerging with pandemics. We can see it. Also, we can see that the truth alone is the solution. We cannot lie anymore. Our, our politicians lie nonstop. They are always presenting the truth. They try to, to make uh, things look like true, but um, because they know that's how they get their votes because they want to, to be true always. But the truth alone prevails, as the uh, Indian slogan says, Satyam eva jayate. Yes, true, truth alone will save us. So we have to see what it is. We have to develop ourselves spiritually. This is the way out. If the question is how the spirituality may help us, it is how it will help us we will have to discover the truth of ourselves and our social order. Uh, there is no other way, only way forward to, to be more and more true to ourselves and relations in the world. Right. Uh, Soumya Chakravarti uh, is there and he is asking the need of the hour in my experience is to realize that the divine is cleansing Mother Earth. The cleansing is making possible the main manifestation, manifestation of harmonious Earth. The souls that have the burning aspiration to progress will be able to ascend in credible time. I request Vladimirji to put in perspective how the event that are unfolding is making possible the acceleration of evolution and spiritual progress. You mean uh, the pandemics? You are referring to pandemics, or what? What event? I think um, he he is referring to pandemics, right? Yeah. yeah. If it is to pandemics, then yes. Then um, of course, what pandemics did to us? First of all, it was very scary. First, that such. A, virus exists, everybody got scared. And you remember how the, the, there were only few people still infected, but the, the, ra the ratio of deaths was much higher. You remember it, it came nearly to uh, like 18%. Now it is back to 6%. So there are many more infected, but much less dying. Why? The fear disappeared. That fear that, you know, that uh, shrinking from this, uh, from this event created a lot of um, uh, anxiety and also opened up uh, to these um, darker forces to enter and actually end many lives. Um, Mother speaks about it. The fear is actually the gate for these forces to come and to disturb us and to hit us. So once fear is gone slowly and gradually fear was gone, there were other events in the US, you know, I cannot breathe and so on. You remember that all these still are going on. Um, um, so people kind of overcame their fear with other important issues in the society. And uh, that also created a new kind of perspective. This happened in many countries, not only in the US, but uh, there are many more infected people, but there is less fear. And, um, and the same happened in Russia, the same happened in Europe and other countries. I think, uh... We don't have uh, questions here, and uh, all right. Yeah, so uh, I'm I'm thankful to Vladimirji 
and uh, team uh, on behalf of our university. And uh, I thankful to our vice chancellor and dean also, who's, who are always uh, you know very supportive uh, in conducting CLC programs. Uh, Vladimirji, it is very enriching experience for us uh, when there are quest for truth, when there is a quest for uh, you know knowing this how this you know world works or how this life works. Uh, uh, we will be, you know, progressing. That's what I feel. So questions are always there, and uh, not necessary that we get answer permanently or we get accurate answer. But I think we will be coming back with lots of questions in coming, you know, many sessions like this. I thank you, audience, on behalf of both CLC, Labras as well as Suru. Thank you, Vladimirji. Thank you. Thank you. All the best.